Welcome to Phoenix Masonry Live. A show about Masonic Museum artifacts. Interviews. Masonic history. And much more. I am Frederick L. Milliken, Executive Director of Phoenix Masonry. And I am Elena Llamas, Director of Public Relations for Phoenix Masonry. And we are here to... Celebrate... Our Freemasonry! Celebrando nuestra francmasonería. And that's what we do here. We celebrate our Freemasonry. And today we're celebrating with Randy Zarenda, past Grand Commander of Ledroit Humane. Welcome hi. to the show, Randy. Thanks, Fred. Thanks for inviting me. And hi, Elena. Hi. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Randy Zarenda originally joined Ledroit Humane because some of his friends were members. He didn't think he wanted to be a Mason until he had a dream after which he applied. He was initiated November 19, 1989, passed October 1990, and raised March 1991. He never thought he wanted to go past being a Master Mason until he had another dream, which he couldn't shake the memory of. He was made a Knight of the Rose Cross, 18th degree, April 1995. Same thing happened once more, as he didn't think he would go any further until he had dreams. He applied and entered the Oropagus in May 2006. The most puissant Grand Commander or Grand Master at the time was looking for her successor. She thought Randy was a good candidate. She called him and told him that he would be entering the North American consistory in February of 2007, and he was given the 33rd degree in Paris in May of 2007. He was made a member of the Supreme Council of the International Order for Freemasonry for Men of Freemasonry for Men and Women, Le Draw Humain, two days later. He held that position for 10 years. So once again, welcome, Randy. Well, thank you. I guess the, I guess the lesson to be learned is be careful of your dreams. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. You know, you know, Randy, we have a lot of uh, viewers, uh, not only in the United States, but uh, from Australia, Japan, Great Britain. and. Uh, we have a lot of Prince Hall viewers. We have a lot of mainstream Mason uh, viewers. Uh, and I I know that a lot of them may be watching this show, and they have no idea what the great humane is all about. So perhaps you could, uh, in a nutshell, give us a little uh, a little talk about what, what we're talking about today. <laughs> sure. Well, I think that... First, you know, Le Droit Humain is a, is a French set of words, and its literal translation means human rights. And so um, the kind of masonry which I represent is known as human rights masonry. Um, the, it started back in the late 1800s in, around Paris. There were several lodges there whose um, members of the Grand Orient of France were um, wondering why it was that since they were working towards the perfecting of humanity, it didn't also include uh, women and, uh, and other persons that were not considered uh, eligible for masonry at the time. And they agitated for an experiment. So finally, the Grand Orient um, decided that they would make this experiment with five lodges around Paris, in which those five lodges would be allowed to initiate women. It was both fortunate and unfortunate that the experiment was very successful and that these lodges were growing and admitting um, spouses and daughters and mothers of, of the brethren who were members there. And that part of it was fine until they started admitting members who, women especially, who were applying, who were not already related to a member of that lodge. Some of the other lodges around the Grand Orient were um, becoming a little uncomfortable with where things were going and wanted to shut the experiment down. 
but it's like you know Pandora's box. Once you open the lid and you let whatever's in there out, it's really hard to put it all back in again and close it down. So what their, the decision was that rather than shutting down those lodges and shutting down such a um, successful experiment is what they were doing, that they would allow these lodges to form their own Grand Lodge. This then became the basis for the formation of Dwa Human. Well, uh, so many things to ask. Uh, first, I want to, uh, we want to uh, um, put out a shout out to the Masonic Roundtable show in case after you view this interview, you're interested in more uh, detailed history of the organization, you can go watch their episode uh, 135 with yours truly, which was a appearance that you, Randy, helped me prepare for. And I have to say, it was a, a pleasure to work with you. I learned so much from you. Our viewers can see already that you just exude information. And uh, uh, one thing that um, caught both uh, Fred's and my, my attention when we introduced you was the dreams. So you had this dream and you applied to be a Mason, you knew some of your friends were Mason, and then you had another dream that inspired you to go beyond the Master Mason uh, degree. So tell us about that. Is this, was this uh, unusual? Are you a dreamer? <laughs> I'm not actually, you know, um, my wife will tell you that she could run a marching band through the bedroom and I wouldn't hear it. <laughs> I'm one of those really deep sleepers. And so when I dream, and I wake up to, and remember that dream, it's a rather unusual event. And so when it becomes a recurring dream, it's something that I can't help but pay attention to it. One other thing about your introduction was uh, mentioned that you were um, given your 33rd degree in Paris. What's the relevance of Paris for the entire organization? Can you tell us uh, how it is structured and why Paris is important and why the name is in French? Well, the name is in French as Le Droit Human because we were incorporated in France and um, as, an, as an obedience, as an order. And so um, we have federations and jurisdictions and pioneer lodges all over the world, but our corporate headquarters exist in um, Paris, France. And so that's why um, the name remains in French. But once we go outside of the French speaking, the Francophone countries, um, we use the name in a, in a translated way so that here in Anglophone countries, we call it Freemasonry for Men and Women. And oh. in Spanish-speaking countries, they'll, re they'll refer to it as human rights, derechos uh, humanos. Uh, and uh, the, the motto of the order is, you know, that it is a mixed order. So in French and in Spanish, saying that it's Freemasonry mixed, Everybody understands that that means that it's a mixture of people. But when we go out into English, the, the, the term then was used as co-masonry or co-freemasonry. And that didn't give the same impression in today's world as it did back in the late 1800s and early 1900s. So um, we were known as co-masons for quite a long time in the Anglophone world. But we changed it so that we can give the impression that we're not um, ancillary masons. We're not uh, masons that are are um, irregular or unusual. We are Freemasons, but that we are Freemasons who admit both men and women as co-equal. So this is an international organization. Then, so how does it run? Like having so many. Uh countries involved, and how many countries are they are they involved? Um, I'm not prepared to tell you how many countries there are involved because there are just too many. <laughs> but we have about 30 federations and jurisdictions. You know, it, it, it may be 31 as of today. And um, when I first became a member of the Supreme Council, the International Constitution defines members as members are 
that, that the, better, that the order is made up of members who can form pioneer lodges, jurisdictions, or federations. And so in my second term, the constitution was changed so that now the order consists of federations, jurisdictions, and pioneer lodges, who's members, et cetera, et cetera. So that that purpose was to transfer the centrality of the order from the international headquarters to the various bodies throughout the throughout the world so that, that our constitution now guarantees absolute freedom, sovereignty, independence, et cetera, et cetera, to all of its federations. And the federations then have their own internal governance and so forth. So the 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 formation, the, the structure of the order has been in flux over the last ten years. But now we're we're on pretty firm footing and in a and our direction is pretty clear that we're trying to be as inclusionary as we can possibly be, while at the same time extending control to the local and national bodies. Uh, we mentioned in the uh, in your introduction that you have held the position of Grand Commander for ten years, and you just retired. Uh, why ten years, and were you elected? Um, a person can be reelected Grand Commander twice, and each term is a five-year term. So I was eligible for a third term, which would have taken it for 15. Um, yes, the Grand Commander is elected, and the Grand Commander is elected at the um, International Convention, which is held every five years, and it's held at the International Headquarters in Paris. Obviously, each federation will put forward their candidate, and in the United States, our Grand Council um, decided who we who we were going to put forward as our next candidate. I had decided that um, after I was about seven or eight years in, that everything that I had set out to accomplish was was pretty much done, <laughs> and I felt that it was then. Um, a really appropriate time for us to transfer to another grant commander who would be able to then bring in some fresh ideas and continue what we've already been doing here, both in the United States, I should say the American Federation, and within the, um, the context of what goes on in the international level. So Randy, tell us a little bit about your tenure as Grand Commander, perhaps you could share with us some of uh, your, your your favorite accomplishments. Well, I think that um, um, the accomplishment is to compare how things were done ten years ago as to how they're done today, and that was primarily what I set out to do was to decentralize the whole process. When I came in, it really was the Grand Commander that um, did everything. And I come from a business background, I'm a business guy, and you know, my first instinct is to um, uh, find persons who can, who can um, take on certain responsibilities. And, and in addition to that, in my whole career as a Freemason, I've seen Freemasonry's huge influence in, um, uh, leadership development. And I saw our lodges and our order as being a great tool to develop leaders and develop leadership qualities. And the only way for me to make that happen in my federation was to devolve that central that centralization of control and of decision making and start to empower persons to take on those responsibilities and take on that leadership. And so I think that probably was my favorite and and most fulfilling part of what I've what's accomplished during those ten years is that the grand commander will no longer ever personally select their successor. It's, we now have a grand council to do that. That um, there are uh, rules and regulations that spell out very clearly what the rights and responsibilities of each of our lodges is. 
and the lodges can now function by having their orator understanding those rules and regulations and it minimizes the involvement of the grand commander in the inner workings of any of our lodges. Excellent. Do, can you tell us your least favorite part of, of the role of grand commander <laughs> since that was well, your favorite? Um, <laughs> yeah, I think that it was a little bit of a surprise to me that I don't know why it was, but it, I had to quickly learn that as leadership development occurs, it also has the, the opposite effect sometimes of bringing out within us senses of power and um, how do we apply that power. And um, being the grand commander and being responsible for those persons whom I might ask to take on certain responsibilities um, allowed me to see how people would use power and um, uh, and, and, and how it affected them. And, and also myself, I mean, it was a great learning experience for myself and how I was going to apply power. And um, that was my least favorite part of it, was looking in the mirror sometimes and saying, you know, um, um, in this particular situation, yes, I can make the decision, but I need people to, to come to their own conclusions about issues that they're involved in. And so how to guide them without their taking and abusing power was a very difficult process. In addition, um, because we're a, we're a mixed order and we have men and women working together, I think that probably another really favorite part of, of for me about being in Freemasonry, Le Duahiman, is that I get the opportunity to work with women and men as co-equal. And there's no sexual tension in that process. And that's a unique experience for a lot of people, and sadly to say, that we don't get the opportunity to work really closely with persons of another gender and have that close relationship without sexual tension being involved. And so some of my least favorite parts is where that tension might flare up and I'd have to get involved. And that that those were probably my least my two least favorite things, and they both have to do with human the human condition. Uh, you mentioned your Masonic career. Have you did you enter? Uh, I'm going to call it LDH <laughs> from now on uh, okay. instead of Latrachuman. Uh, yeah. uh, did you start out in? the organization or did you uh, come from a different uh, organization, a uh, Masonic organization? Well, I, I started my Masonic career in Guajiman, in LDH, um, but I didn't really come into Freemasonry in the same way that perhaps a lot of other people do. I started off, you know, as a kid being um, growing up in upstate New York, being introduced to lots of people who were involved in philosophical um, pursuits. And I knew people who were Rosicrucians, I knew people who were Theosophists. Um, and, and I felt that um, that was something that was very attractive to me. I was particularly attracted to the Theosophical Society because of its openness to allow each of its members um, free thinking. And so um, it took me a while to come to understand that Dwa Human as a Masonic order is also committed to allowing and promoting its memberships the right and the ability to be free thinkers. And um, there was a little bit of a, of, a, of a discussion in the early days, perhaps that would have been a better name for the order than human rights but human rights won out and I'm kind of glad it did. Oh, well, I noticed you say draw human without the le. So it's the human right, right? The is le, and, and so you, you do people also say without the le? Well, you know. I've heard, I've heard it, I, I've heard it. You've heard it both ways maybe. Yeah. Yeah, you know, Portuguese is my second language. So Latin languages are somewhat familiar to me as I think they might be to you as a Spanish speaker. 
And so the article is put there in Latin languages, but we drop it frequently in English. And so we wouldn't say the human rights as, as it, you know, when we're talking about an organization, but because it's a very formal term and it is the name of an organization, in Latin languages, the article is put there. So le droit humain, and often in French, the word le for the is lowercase. So it gives no. you that the real name is droit humain. Oh, very, very interesting. Uh, I've also I've also heard just draw the draw draw. I mean, you yeah. pronounce it just the D word <laughs> by itself. Well, and, and uh, in Spanish, I've seen it many times just derechos humanos. I've not seen los in front of it, so it's the same deal that the article gets dropped. You were talking about uh, your least favorite part, seeing the the dynamics of power, and I think that's a Masonic dilemma with all the. The fancy titles and the uh, the hierarchical aspects of it, uh, I think that's a challenge for all Freemasons. And as you were saying, um, this is Freemasonry, and so uh, obviously free thought is something that is developed in leadership. And um, I think my way of putting this aspect of Freemasonry is always herding cats. Freemasonry is is full of free thinkers and doers and. And, and often, you know, it is like herding cats when, when the power dynamics uh, uh, come up. I'd like to explore with you a little bit how LDH uh, interacts with the outer world. Um, because I think it might be a little bit different and our Prince Hall Freemasons and our mainstream Freemasons might operate a little bit differently and might want to know about the way you do it. So. What I'm going to give you is two scenarios or two different aspects here, and you tell me which one more fits. Wow. Fits, fits better, LDH. Okay. Okay, we'll try. Freemasonry. <laughs> First choice: Freemasonry, closed, cloistered, monastic society, or Freemasonry, open, fraternal society partner. Well, I think you raised some really good um, um, concepts about Freemasonry, not just in Dwakuman, but Freemasonry in general. And I think that um, Dwakuman will probably fit somewhere between those two extremes, those two poles. And so, in addition, it's going to also depend upon in which part of the world you are. If you're outside of the Anglophone country as a Dwahuman member, you're absolutely acknowledged, you are accepted, you are invited to ceremonies and meetings of other Masonic obediences. The, 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 the relationship and the cloistering and so forth has been an ongoing struggle for the American Federation and other Anglophone um, Federation for the last 60, 70 years. I felt that it was really um, um, an opportunistic moment for us to come out of that cloister. And so when I became the Grand Commander, I really started um, opening up and allowing people to become more involved with mainstream Freemasonry and uh, promoting them to um, let their communities know that they exist if they're comfortable with it. Um, we, by and large, with just a very few exceptions, found that it was very a, wel a very welcoming um, uh, community of Freemasons out there. I've heard a criticism, not that I agree with it, but it had, that says that LDH is one big esoteric study group, and that's primarily all it does. So. Uh, uh, dissuade me of my uh, prejudices. Well, um, you know, I think that most of us who are Freemasons have come to a conclusion that all of our rituals and degrees are promoting the building of an edifice. And so however we symbolically view that edifice to be is how we're going to approach our our, our um, both inner work 
and our work in society and our work in charity. And so in Le Duachemin, each lodge has as its absolute right to decide where its um, bag of benevolence will be distributed. Um, the lodges frequently support um, uh, programs in their own communities or on a national level. But in addition, we have um, something called SPES, which is a French acronym for meaning, you know, children um, who are um, uh, suffering. And the SPES is, is, a, is an organization that's pretty much universally supported by um, Duahiman members and lodges around the world. Its, uh, its function and purpose was originally to um, um, address the issues of AIDS in Africa. Um, for those who don't know much about Africa, um, the, especially in Western and Eastern Africa, the um, uh, children and um, communities are very close-knit, and I should say first, close-knit close communities created a system to support the raising of children. And so a child in a village in Africa, in Western East Africa, would have, you know, a hundred aunties and a hundred uncles all looking out for them, even though they're not blood related. Mm -hmm. And so when AIDS struck in that part of the world and parents began contract dying of AIDS, the um, grandparents took over the raising of children, those children who were orphans, and um, aunts and uncles and community members and so forth. But nevertheless, there was going to, logic would tell us that there are going to be those children who are going to fall through the cracks and they don't have anybody. And that's what SPES was created for. And so we originally accepted children who were either orphaned by AIDS or who had been born with the, with the virus and um, were no longer accepted in their families. And we took them in. And so it's now that AIDS is, is becoming less and less of a threat, we've expanded our focus somewhat to be taking in children who's, who are orphaned by other means than, than just AIDS. From every, everything I've known, sorry, sorry, I just want to follow up with one question. From everything I, I, I knew before, SPES was separate from LDH, right? It's not a branch of LDH because um, I know that it has other, other organizations that support it. Am I, am I correct in that? That's right. It is a, it is a totally separate um, uh, corporation. And so we have SPES International and then we have SPES Togo. SPES, oh. the, the sites are located in Togo in West Africa. It's a West African country. And so um, it wouldn't really be a charity if it was part of Duahiman. It would then be um, considered to be a part of our organization and perhaps less thought of as charity. And in addition, by having it be a separate corporation, it allows us to enlist the help of non-Masons in supporting the work that these that, that our facilities in West Africa do. So, um, Fred, I interrupted you before. No, I was just going to thank Randy for laying to rest some misinformation about LDH. I think it was very important. Very nice what you said. So, um, it, it, you know, our, our teaching is the same as every mainstream Freemason, that our first duty is to charity. And that bag of benevolence sits right by the door, and everybody is expected to contribute to it. And, then, the, and then each lodge decides where that money goes. So, LDH, you mentioned it would be part, SPES would be I, I, I can't remember how you said it, that if it was part of LDH, it would be, wouldn't be thought of as a charity. Does LDH have any LDH charities? Uh, I'm thinking of the Shriners. I'm thinking of other Masonic organizations, which are charitable organizations within a Freemasonic order. LDH has something else, which you just explained. Am I right? That's right. And, it, you know, in order to participate in the work of the it does not require a person to be a Freemason. 
However, having said that, all of our lodges and all of our members worldwide are kept up to date on what's going on in SPES. And a large number of the federations and lodges around the world give some part of their charitable support to SPES. And so I don't know about every lodge in the world, but here in the United States, the, the primary focus is around November, the lodges take an, make an analysis of what's in their bag of benevolence, what is the, the potential needs for supporting members in need within their lodge, and then what's available for contribution to charities. And they vote on it every year how they're going to make that charitable contribution. So if there's some yeah. special need in their community, that's going to come first. Yeah, and I think. I'm sorry. I think that no, it's okay. The critique that Fred was uh, has heard, I have heard it also because SPES is the only charity listed, kind of the endorsed charity of the organization. So uh, uh, the critique I have heard, uh, which is the same worded a little different, is well, what about the LDH promoting like a U.S. or other uh, a variety? Of course, the work in Africa is you know you were explaining you know uh and so it it's not an organized effort it's at the lodge level that members are donating money uh to you know the, the bag and and that goes to where that lodge wants to uh take it to and and, and also some lodges will, will club up together and have something jointly that they're trying to support you know so that um that's also not very uncommon that they'll do that. The concept of, the, of Dwajiman being an esoteric school also is something that I'd like to address. And so that um, our do. lodges are free to, under our international constitution, to work to the glory of the great architect of the universe and or to the perfecting of humanity. And here in the United States, anyway, I think that pretty much all of our lodges work to both. And I know that around the world, there are some lodges that work only to the glory of the great architect, and there are some lodges that only work to the perfecting of humanity. And so um, I think that the flavor that you get, that the, that the, the, the direction that your members are going to put their study focus is set in the decision that you make at the very beginning about what is the basis for the workings of your lodge. And so if, if a lodge wants to be um, looking to the, deep, at the deepest aspects of the symbolic meaning of, of masonry, the allegorical meaning of masonry, they're absolutely free to do so. If they want to work towards understanding what are the social um, implications of, of human progression, they're absolutely able to do that too. And so um, we see our lodges um, frequently trying to work to vote, but they often will, we often as well will see lodges who are trying to work in one direction or another. What do you see as the advantages of mixed gender Freemasonry versus male craft or female craft lodges? What's the advantage? Well, I think it goes even further than that, Brad. I think that Wahuman is not only mixed because of its admission of men and women as co-equal. We're mixed because we don't care about what your nationality, your um, language, your ethnicity, your racial background, your sexuality, or any of your belief systems. And so that creates an altogether different basis for our, our lodges to open and work in allowing absolute freedom of conscience from all of its members and how they are go how, when they come into it. But the relationship between the members is going to be very similar and if not almost the same as it is in every Freemasonic Lodge. So what makes, what's the advantage to us being mixed is that I think that it gives me anyway the opportunity of being, um, 
a part of a brotherhood that admits all aspects of my society and the people that I deal with and allows me to express my thoughts in front of them, test my theories in front of them, get their feedback in a very honest sort of a way. And it, it makes me a better human being, in my opinion. Good answer. Fred, you threw out that, that choice question and this, this came to my mind too. Huh. Uh, LDH doesn't have, it's smaller in size, it's a smaller operation than, uh, you know, what we call mainstream masonry in our show, and um, it, it doesn't have a, a, a lot of writers and artists and Masonic, I'm talking Masonic, it has, it has uh, I'm sure, a lot of writers and, 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 and artists, but Masonic writers, Masonic artists, Masonic uh, producers of uh, film, uh, and these are just examples of uh, you know liberal arts and science within the within the teachings of Freemasonry. Do you foresee a day where uh, LDH will have a flourishing of the arts? And do do you uh, see it now? Is this something that you would um, say it's, it's coming, or how how do you um, see the the development of the arts and, and sciences, a Masonic, within the organization. Okay. Dwahiman has about 70,000 members. And so I don't know if that to you means that we're a small organization or a large well, organization. Is or, this in the, in the U.S. or worldwide? No, this is worldwide. So Dwahiman is worldwide. American Federation is, the, is what's in the, within the United States. So it's the American Federation of Dwahiman. How many are, are they in the American Federation? Sorry. Okay, just a second. So if you were to go to another country, let's say you go to Canada, then it's it's the Canadian Federation of Dwajiman. You go to Colombia, it's the Colombian Federation of Dwajiman. So it, in those countries where it's Anglophone, the numbers have always been small. And I don't know exactly why that is, but as I've gone through the historical um, writings about what was going on in the various times, it seems that in the Anglophone countries, the fact of non-recognition has made it very difficult for people to feel comfortable proclaiming themselves as Freemasons in open <laughs> society. Now, if you go outside of that and you go into countries that are not Anglophone, Freemasonry flourishes in Le Dwajiman. And the writers the, in French and Spanish are prolific. So, um, it, 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 you know, in, in, in terms of the arts and so forth, what's kind of interesting, I always found interesting, is that in Europe, there are many lodges that are formed around art. And so if you are a, a musician, there are multiple lodges to which you can belong that are predominated by musicians. Or if you're, nice. if you're a vocalist or any other thing. So it kind of takes us back to the guild um, concept of our lodges in that they're able to um, look at the allegories and the symbolism of Freemasonry and apply it to their arts. One of the things you mentioned that you uh, uh, did during your tenure was to be more interacted or more interactive or more open with the other types of masonry. And you said that almost all of the time it's a very welcoming. So when you are talking about a very welcoming experience, so when you're talking about recognition, you're talking about a formal uh, Grand Lodge uh, document and policy of, of recognition of LDH, you're not talking about the day-to-day -day interactions with uh, non-official masons of the other masonries? Yeah, I, that's exactly right. I mean, in terms of official recognition, um, we know that that's something that, you know, is unlikely to happen in my lifetime. Right. Uh, and, but in, but ter in terms of recognition between us as brethren, as, as workers, as builders, um, that recognition is something that I find very easy to develop because all you got to do is start talking the language and another Mason can't help but to respond to it. I do want to mention there's an English uh, book 
by uh, two authors of the English, uh, the UK LDH uh, Federation, which is called More Light, Today's Freemasonry for Men and Women. And the authors are Julian Reese and uh, Darren Laurente Poole. Both of those art authors, by the way, started their Masonic career in the United Grand Lodge of England and came to LDH, and they came as writers already. And so they coming from this environment of the United Grand Lodge of England with lots of, you know, uh, uh, writing going on into the uh, UK Federation. So over there in England, they are seeing that uh, development over there. Um, and I think, and I think that there's been a really uh, too long of a dry spell for our English brethren in Duachiman in writing about Duachiman. You know, in the early 1900s, it was prolifically done. We had Leadbeater and Bassant and, and uh, Bailey and, and, and multiple others writing about the Duachiman and Freemasonry in general. And um, when, the second, when the first war ended, and after that, it began to die down. By the second war, it was, it was, it, it, we've been going through a very dry spell in English writers. And so I, I hope that we're almost over with that. Uh, do you have any feeling of what caused this drying out of, of authors? Or it seems to me, if I may add my two cents, that one fired up the other and they really, you know, they were really going at it as a group. But, uh, uh, and, and and perhaps that that group um, you know because people influence each other so perhaps that is not happening I don't know I I'll let you answer. I think that the members in those days who were prolific writers about Freemasonry and about with Dwajiman in particular, um, they came into Dwajiman um, from another from other organizations and they were actively writing. In those other organizations as well, so that they're coming into Dwajiman and being Freemasonry Masons, it was a natural extension for them to write about it. Um, so, kind of like we were talking about the United Grand Lodge of England, these are people who came from the Theos Theosophical Society, notably, and other organizations which had a culture of writers right. and sort of came into LDH. So, that's a good thing about having uh, interactions. We were talking about LDH's interactions with the the Freemasonic world and the charitable world and the public uh, because you get new fresh ideas with people who are coming with different backgrounds. And I think after the Second War, the American Federation in particular, it's important to note that the American Federation was the first federation in Duahuman. And so oh. we, are, we are the oldest federation in Duahuman. Older than France? Oh yeah, by several years. Thanks to Louis Guizou, who I saw you put his, his picture up a, a little while ago, who was our first Grand Commander. And, I'll do it again. All right. And so this, this process then in the American Federation, World War II um, created a, a, a society, perhaps, that we became less and less um, interested in joining organizations that were going to have a impact upon society as a whole. And so this dry spell, I think, is probably um, a symptom of what society in the United States was going through after World War II until today. I see that symptom going away and that um, one of the things that we were uh, trying to put together in the last term, my last term, and which my successor has said she wants to continue and is committed to creating is the lodges of research within the uh, the Dwajiman American Federation. Nice. And these lodges of research, as they're currently structured, will have as their um, uh, objective the publication of what's um, uh, of what these members are are putting together. So that we hope that this will create a an environment in which we can publish something that will be interesting to not only Freemasonry in general, but perhaps to the public at large. We've always, Excellent, because we've always published our own newsletter, but it's been an internal kind of thing. And not an internal thing. And meanwhile, the mainstream Freemasonries and other Freemasonries have been very uh, prolific. 
Exactly right. And and they and 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 they should be highly, highly respected and commended for it. And it's a great example for us to try to follow. Okay. Well, uh, you know, uh, Lena, I'm going to leave you the philosophical questions because you are just so good at that. But I would like to ask Randy about the three rituals in LDH. And I know you have three rituals, but tell us about each. Okay. Um, our international constitution says that any lodge can work any ritual that's been approved by the Supreme Council. And so there are far more than three. But oh, in, okay. In the American Federation, there are three that are currently being worked. There are many more that lodges could work if they wished. Ah, <laughs> I learn something new every day. I think the UK uses five. And the UK has a very unique, um, uh, a couple of unique rituals, but one that I particularly find fascinating is the Irish ritual, with, in which the lodge is in the round rather than in, a, in, a, in an oblong square. And so um, the, 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 the rituals that are available to us are created so that any group of people can come together and find a ritual that suits their group personality hmm. and their ability to express that group personality within Freemasonry. Okay, but in the essence of time, can you tell us about the three po most popular ones in the United States of America? The three rituals in the United States that we're currently working are known as the Lauderdale ritual, which is a pretty much a uh, a copy of the emulation ritual that comes from the Grand Lodge of England, and it's been having it's got some revisions within it, but right down to um, uh, the charges and all, it's pretty much emulation. The other ritual is the is what we call the George Martin ritual. It used to be called the Continental ritual, but it was called Continental in Anglo countries because it never really had a name. It was the lot. It was the go-to ritual if you <laughs> were wanting to work Scottish rite, and so it is primarily was primarily used in the continent of Europe, and um, people always thought of it as kind of like a French ritual. And so Louis Guizou, our first Grand Commander, was a French guy, and. Um, when he came here, he opened up the first lodge of Dwight Human in the United States in 1903 in Pennsylvania. And the um, ritual that he knew was and worked was what we would now call the George Martin ritual. And so he opened up George Martin ritual lodges all over the country. And then came along the Theosophical um, influence and Annie Besant and Gennaro Jadassa and Manley P. Hall and their focus was the um, Grand Lodge of England or emulation what we call Lauderdale ritual and so the two rituals in the United States Guazou saw them as creating perhaps um, instead of following a single stream that it was going to create a situation where the streams would start to, to separate and segue. And so he created what's known as the North American ritual, which is an attempt at trying to bring in the esoteric, um, highly um, uh, uh, philosophic concept of the Lauderdale and marry it with the practical approach that the George Martin or um, continental ritual takes and bring the two together and create something that was uniquely suited to the American psyche. And so within the American Federation, now we have lodges working all three of these various rituals and it adds to the diversity, it adds to the mixity of our order and of our federation. And I don't know of any federation anywhere in the world who works only one of them, one ritual. Every federation has a combination of rituals that their lodges work because they're guaranteed that right under our constitution. How, how well, secular is the George Martin ritual? Not at all. Um, okay. um, the George Martin ritual is the, um, is to me, um, 
Now you're asking, I, I'm going to take off my Grand Commander hat and become just a member. Oh, God, please. <laughs> and say to you about what my personal um, view of the various rituals are and how they work. Oh, yes. Yeah, just... That wonderful. The Georges Martin Continental Ritual sets the symbols and allegories before its members to speculate upon. It's that simple. It just lays them out there, and each member is, and this, this guy here that you're looking at, this picture is Georges Martin, and the only reason why we call it the Georges Martin Ritual is because he, as far back as we can discover in our archives, it was he who took the Grand Orient of France Ritual and, um, and adapted it to Dwight Human, and so we call it the Georges Martin Ritual. The, so this George, Mar this George Martin ritual is created to set forth the, the allegories and symbols for the members to speculate upon. And it doesn't tell you what they mean. It allows the members to look at those allegories from both a spiritual and a social point of view. Hmm. I think that all of your viewers who hold higher degrees are going to agree with me when I say that as secular as we can make a Blue Lodge and the rituals within the Blue Lodge, those higher degrees become more and more spiritualized. So even Georges Martin members who they themselves consider themselves as being secular are going to find themselves having to look within themselves and what their moral compass is as they go through the various rituals that follow their tradition. The Lauder, sorry, did you want, me, did you want to ask me a question about that? No, no, no. no I, okay. I, don't, I have, I have something going. important, but finish, finish. <laughs> Keep going. The Lauderdale is something that probably more of your American viewers are familiar with in that it, it, it follows very closely the Grand, Orient, the Grand Lodge of England and the emulation ritual. And so, I see this ritual as being um, Baroque in its style. It tries to raise us in our uh, view of things to a higher level. And, it, it, and each individual is, is, is encouraged to look first within oneself and then take that as high as one can take it in unifying that concept of one with all. Uh -huh. The... Um, North American ritual is, is the marriage between the two in that both the Georges Martin and North American rituals do not use the word God <laughs> because the word God can be interpreted by people of different traditions in different ways. And so we refer to the great architect of the universe rather than God. And the Lauderdale ritual will use the term the great architect of the universe, but refers specifically to God with a capital G. And this slight difference, you might say, is, the, is, is, is bridging the secular with the religious, but I don't really see it that way. You know, I feel my lodge work, the North American ritual, and... Um, in my lodge, we have Roman Catholics, Greek Orthodox, uh, Jews, Muslims, uh, Buddhists, Hindus. Where is this lodge? lodge? Not Miami. Um, <laughs> 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 you know, we have Protestants of all stripes. Um, we have Wiccans, we have believers, and we have non-believers. But we don't know what that person's belief system is or religion, religious affiliation, if any, unless they tell us. It's not part of the membership process. It's not part of the inquiry. It's something that we each can divulge to the other if we feel that it's somehow important. If you could please tell us what CLIPSES is, because we were talking about LDH uh, and its interactions to mainstream mainstream, but what about to other mixed masonries and other, I'm going to call them alternative masonries, there's this huge, over 90 plus international Masonic organizations that have all joined the appeal of, my pronunciation, you say it, Randy, tell us what it is, the appeal of what? 
Belford. The um, CLIPSIS is an interesting organization in that it is an umbrella organization for um, Masonic lodges and Masonic groups. Um, Dwahuman does not is not a member of CLIPSIS. And it's listed there because under our current international constitution, each federation ha can become, can, can set up its own um, relationships with other um, obediences and bodies within their jurisdiction. Oh, I see. So now many of our, our federations have joined CLIPSIS. And, I see. And so by having the order join CLIPSIS, it was thought that you know, by us in the Supreme Council that that might have been something that we were then saying to our members that we thought this was something that you too should be involved in. Whereas by allowing our federations and or our lodges to make that decision on their own, it, we've given them the freedom to do so. Yeah, I just wanted to, to correlate another question with that. Would you say that uh, LDH then is less top heavy, I mean, top down uh, uh, management than mainstream and Prince Hall Freemasonry. It's more what the local lodges want to do. There's more power to the local lodges. So would, would you say that? I don't know about power, Fred, but I would say that there's more freedom. Okay. Um, I think that, um, you know, we in Dwajiman follow very closely the hierarchical systems that all Freemasons follow. And, and one other thing that I think that, that, that I've heard said about Dwajiman that you guys didn't ask me about is the whole concept about liberal or conservative Freemasonry. And the, that um, many times people are looking to joining CLIPSIS because they want to join an organization that will put them in touch with other liberal, quote unquote, liberal um, Freemasonic organizations. I don't think that, I, I, I certainly I don't, and I don't think that the members of the Supreme Council or most of our federations see Dwight Humann as a liberal form of Freemasonry. We follow all the landmarks that, 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 that mainstream Freemasonry follows, except that, you know, we feel that working to the perfecting of humanity, we should be an inclusive rather than an exclusive club. And so the, the, that is primarily the only difference between us and mainstream Freemasons. Mm. So if that makes mm. us liberal, then okay, we're liberal. But in terms of being Freemasons, I think that I would not put that label upon us. And um, so that I think that the other thing is, is that we in Duahiman feel that any organization who is working to the glory of the great architect and to the perfecting of humanity is worthy of our support. And so we acknowledge and recognize any obedience or organization who has that as their underpinning because we see them then as being comrades with us in um, fighting tyranny and uh, raising people from, uh, uh, being, from superstition to uh, wisdom. And that really, nice. that really is what I think um, is the basis of all Freemasonic teaching in building that edifice. I've learned some a lot more than I knew when I started this uh, interview. And thank you. <laughs> yes, well, thank you very much. Same here. I want to say thank you to both of you and, and to all of your viewers for um, your interest in uh, the celebration of Freemasonry. I really like that expression very much, and I'm glad that you guys are involved in that process and that- Celebrate! Um, that's exactly, <laughs> that's exactly Sometimes we take ourselves a little too seriously, and- <laughs> Not <absolutely>. here! <laughs> and so that ability to celebrate Freemasonry is something quite fun to have participated in, and I thank you very much. All oh, right. <laughs> well, thank you, Randy, and thank you. That's all we have for you this time. Parting on the square. But Elena and I would like to talk to you about supporting this video channel and Phoenix Masonry. Phoenix Masonry is having its annual fundraising raffle. This year, it's a 40-year-old set of prints depicting the three Masonic tracing boards 
designed by Frida Harris. Tickets are $5 each or five tickets for $20. Simply click on the PayPal donate but button on our Facebook or Phoenix Masonry homepage at www.phoenixmasonry.org and we will mail you the correct number of tickets for the money you have donated. We will close ticket sales on December 15th, 2017. Please note that Phoenix Masonry Inc. is a registered 501c three tax deductible charity and your donation amount can be deducted from your 2017 federal income taxes. A perfect gift for a Masonic friend.